Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to present uh, some of my research in this audience, to this audience. Um, yeah, it's uh, about human behavior, and it's about a very ugly and dark side of human behavior, as you can imagine. And uh, I will address uh, yeah, recent uh, trends in yeah, the German society, but I think it's not restricted to Germany, about uh, yeah, the diffusion of some xenophobic uh, behavior in society. Uh, and I think it is, in a way, related to collective behavior. Uh, but obviously, we can discuss this as, as a major uh, point uh, later on. So uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to, do, to present this uh, here for the first time in this uh, Center for the Advanced Study of Collective uh, Behavior. Um, so uh, we will see uh, what sociology can maybe add to uh, the discussion uh, that you have uh, in, in the cluster. I give you first some background information, and most of you will be familiar with that, I, I think. So I will talk about the massive migration of refugees to Europe and specifically to, to countries like Germany. You see on this map that not only Germany was uh, the target uh, country of migration beginning uh, here in 2008. It's very small here uh, depicted in this graph, but you see uh, there was a huge increase in number of refugees starting already in the beginning of 2015, but then in September, in the autumn of 2015, there was a massive increase. And you see countries like uh, Germany, Austria, and also Hungary and Sweden, uh, they received a lot of mi uh, migrants uh, refugees coming to their countries. And uh, in Germany, uh, it was about 800,000. It's not quite clear how many uh, they, they were at that time, but this means quite a lot. It's about 1%, not uh, just 1% of the total population of Germany. So this means for a society, uh, as you, we all uh, know, a great uh, challenge. And uh, what happened in the German society was uh, there was this was the major uh, news event for a number of months in Germany. Uh, the media framed it as a refugee crisis all over Europe, but specifically in, in Germany. And in the German uh, society, there was something going on, this polarization process, uh, meaning that uh, we found a very friendly, welcoming uh, behavior for a lot of uh, German citizens. They, they showed their willingness to, to help the arriving ref refugees. And on the other hand, we experienced uh, also this uh, ugly side, um, specifically a drastically growing number of xenophobic attacks in, in these months. And um, next slide will give you uh, an overview. This is from the Federal Criminal Police Office, Bundeskriminalamt, some statistics about the total number uh, of um, attacks by right-wing groups. It's not exactly the same, but the, the overlap is very high on refugee residences. And uh, we see this here for 2014 and 15 uh, in total. And we see there is some uh, regional uh, variation in it. And there's also some uh, variation over time. And uh, this is what I will address in my further talk, how the regional and also the time uh, variation can be to some extent, be explained. Yeah? That's, uh, that's uh, the goal of the whole thing I'm, I'm presenting. 
And now I added some slides to give you an idea about uh, sociology and what it could be a soci sociological perspective on that uh, whole topic. And I begin here with a, a picture that might look uh, familiar to uh, those of you uh, who are uh, PIs in, in the cluster. It was Ulrich Brandes uh, when he was uh, first uh, at Constance uh, yeah, uh, bringing this group uh, of uh, PIs together. This was the so-called Coleman bathtub, uh, the Coleman model, uh, where we uh, distinguish a micro level and a macro level. And uh, usually sociology is interested in phenomena on the macro level. That's, that's our main business. We are interested to explain things on the macro level uh, and Coleman uh, and others, of course, proposed to do it uh, by integrating micro-level behavior as well. And that's, you will see, you will learn from my talk exactly one of the challenges, and I am aware that I, with my data, will not uh, yeah, solve the problem integrating the micro-level uh, here in a, in a very convincing way. But nevertheless, uh, let's, I uh, hope you find this, uh, what I will tell you, interesting. So, uh, for example, we have here uh, macro phenomena as uh, the famous Max Weber thesis on the Protestantism, yeah, the spread of Protestantism uh, in the Western world uh, and uh, the development of capitalistic, capitalist societies or capitalist economies. And these are both uh, phenomena on the macro level. And the challenge is to find, and there are some solutions to that, of course, uh, most, uh, the most prominent one is this David McLelland Achieving Society book. It's also an old one. Uh, trying to, to bridge the macro level to the micro level and then aggregate it again. And I think what is very important uh, to, to say before I start with my uh, data is that I mainly look on the macro level for today. And what makes collective behavior is, of course, the aggregating yeah, of micro uh, level behavior to the, to the aggregate. And that that's uh, something you, you might miss uh, when I talk about uh, my uh, research um, that I have done together with, I missed this to say, with uh, some uh, students uh, and co-workers in my research group. Uh, it's Johannes Laufer, uh, Sandra Walzenbach, and Franziska Lieber. So uh, in sociology, this only looking at the macro level uh, is very much established from the very beginning. And here we have from the German edition of Emil Durkheim's uh, book on suicide, yeah, we have here a table. And, well, Durkheim did this at the end of the 19th century. So at that time, uh, this was fabulous empirical social research on macro-level data. He collected it in, in churches, for example. And here we have it aggregated for Swiss cantons, uh, showing that on the aggregate level, yeah, he took the suicide rate on the aggregate level as an indicator of societal disorder in a society. And he tried to explain it yeah, by different factors. And one is uh, the individualistic orientation people have. And he measured this also with aggregate level variables. Uh, for example, um, the um, proportion in, on, in an aggregate in a Swiss canton of people with Protestantic religion again, and, and so on. And here we have the number of divorces yeah, uh, measured by uh, all uh, marriages, and we have the suicide rates, and there is some correlation. This is only a correlative uh, structure, and of course Durkheim was attacked for a lot of reasons uh, for this, also for methodological reasons, because this is the famous ecological fallacy you can um, you, uh, he's uh, blamed to, he's blamed for, 
And uh, nevertheless, uh, these correlative analysis on the aggregate level have some tradition in sociology. And 100 years after Durkheim, this is still uh, relevant. And here we have some sort of a more empirically focused study by Kate Stovall, published in Social Forces, on something which is more clearly than my example, uh, collective behavior. Here we have lynching uh, in the deep south of the United States. And sorry for this bad uh, map. It's, it's directly from, uh, from this uh, publication. Uh, and I made a bad scan of it. Uh, it shows you five states of the United States. Here we have, uh, it's from uh, west to east. It's Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, and jo Georgia. Well, the direction is not completely right. But we have South Carolina as well. And you see here on a county level, so that's the aggregate level that uh, he studied here. On the county level, you see during a certain period, from the end of the 19th century to, be, to the beginning of the 20th century, how the number of these lynching events um, differed. And uh, what Stobel and uh, we in our research group tried to focus it, uh, at is this sequencing, the time sequencing, and also uh, some, uh, yeah, so to speak, contingent approach processes, spatial contingent processes that we are interested in. So uh, based on these perspectives, my research questions uh, are very, uh, in, in a way, uh, straightforward, I think. So how are these arson attacks against refugees in the years of 2015 to 2017? Uh, is, is there some a diffusion pattern that we can identify, especially do we find uh, some sort of a time lag? Uh, do previous attacks increase the probability of further attacks that we can identify? Is this somewhat uh, explained by socioeconomic or socio-geographic uh, patterns? And when it comes to migration, in sociology uh, there are in principle, uh, two uh, main approaches addressing how the, this uh, integration or the friendliness in the society against strangers moving in uh, are discussed. The first is this uh, per perspective of threat, people coming and threatening uh, the people living already uh, in the, in the, in the uh, country, people uh, migrating to. And uh, this is often called uh, economic threat. And uh, there's also some sort of a cultural threat. That's the, the second position. So we have the econ uh, some competition, a higher competition for economic resources or other, on other markets, housing market, uh, marriage market, whatever. Yeah? And the, uh, the other thing is there are some cultural factors uh, that are threatening people and um, um, yeah, influencing their uh, behavior uh, or their attitude to migrants coming to a country. So um, what we uh, also hope to add or to shine some light on is uh, what is the role uh, that media plays. Yeah, so this is, uh, was heavily debated uh, over uh, years. Uh, that the media informs us about uh, something that happened or did not happen uh, in the case of fake news, and how is this influencing uh, this uh, sequence of uh, attacks? And uh, when I uh, speak about uh, the methods that we use, we, I very much uh, follow uh, these uh, uh, it's a multi-level, discrete logistic regression model, meaning uh, that you have to build up some sort of a panel data set, meaning that the, uh, I, uh, the unit of analysis is the county. Yeah? And then we have for the county, for different time points that we are uh, covering from 2000 
and 15 to 2017, we have, have some uh, entries in the data set. Yeah, that's more or less uh, all, and we have uh, in total a sum of 200, around 250 uh, attacks that were uh, counted on refugee homes. Uh, we created this balanced uh, panel set, uh, and for t uh, about 400 counties, uh, that's the uh, that's what we uh, have here from the uh, administration in, in, in Germany. And we used for the analysis I present today this period of 14 days. Uh, you, you can also question that, of course. And I will inform you about the additional time constant and time variant uh, variables that I added uh, to, to come up to some uh, hopefully interesting conclusions. And um, yeah, what kind of data uh, did we use? So uh, it was our idea, idea to combine um, data of different sources. That means uh, that, uh, of course, we uh, refer to some process data from statistical offices, and we added some uh, additional uh, data uh, that we uh, got from media analysis. I will tell you in a minute how this was uh, conducted. And uh, we also uh, checked whether the timing of some events yeah, triggered the further process. That means we focused on two events here, the border opening in September in Germany. This is referred to border opening. This was Merkel decided uh, with the sentence, wir schaffen das in September uh, 15, uh, was uh, in the international media often referred to as a, some sort of a border opening, uh, letting the refugees uh, mostly from Hungary uh, and Austria to, to Germany. And uh, the second one is this New Year's uh, Eve in Cologne. This was also in the media broadly covered. There was, a, there was a lot of media coverage on uh, sexual um, assaults uh, of refugees against uh, women uh, at that time. So uh, we check whether these broadly covered events in the media also had some uh, influence on the further process that we can see. So uh, this was one of the, uh, I have to say that, uh, I'm in the sociology department, a survey uh, guy usually, and uh, this is, has nothing to do with surveys, but I think surveys in general should be very much referred to uh, data sources uh, that are from processes that are coming from big data, so this is something I'm generally interested in. So coming back to the more uh, specific data we we look at, we have some time constant county level information, uh, and this is on the population size of the county. Uh, we have uh, the unemployment rate indicating some sort of uh, yeah, economic uh, problems that uh, might influence this. We have a very important information about the share of foreigners already living in a county before refugees moved in. And we also checked for the share of voters supporting an extreme right uh, a party, right-wing party. Uh, that's the NPD, NPD National uh, Demokratische Partei. That's the Nazi party. And it's a more radical form of the Alternative uh, für Deutschland. And in 2015, the AfD, AfD was not... Uh, present all over Germany in all these uh, counties. So we refer to uh, the NPD. So that was the reason for the NPD. And there was also time variant county level data, the media coverage of xeno, uh, xenophobic attacks and some fake news. And this is, I think, something that it's, uh, makes this uh, research, I think, uh, more interesting than the, what uh, Durkheim did 100 years ago or so, 120 years ago. So we have here the chance uh, of including media coverage uh, on these uh, xenophobic attacks. And we did this, and 
Of course, this is also something that can be discussed by referring to the Bildzeitung. And the Bildzeitung has regional uh, versions. They, they have, I think, 25 or 27 um, regional editions. And we referred uh, to a media coverage of an, of an uh, attack when it was mentioned in the regional edition uh, of the Bildzeitung. And we included this information uh, to our panel data in a way that uh, the media coverage uh, variable reflects the number of arson attacks reported about in a specific county. And of course, this is done with a lag function. Yeah? Uh, that's also uh, important uh, to know. And uh, the second thing we uh, used is uh, a information about fake news. This was a, I have to say, the dependent variable we used, not the criminal uh, data from the uh, statistical office. Uh, we used some uh, non-governmental uh, organization data set. This seems to be very reliable, and we hope also that this uh, HOAX map uh, is also a rel reliable source. Uh, we have here information about uh, refugees yeah, having been in circulation and uh, which was proved to be false. Yeah? And this is uh, a coverage for this period and it's also possible to uh, locate this in time and space, so to, uh, to say, so we can add this uh, to our data set as well. And we handle this information as we did uh, with the media coverage. And uh, we also have the idea that uh, yeah, spatial processes uh, have something to do with uh, contagion in a spacious sense. Uh, that means that we have to be aware that some counties uh, are closer to uh, some counties uh, in their neighborhoods, of course. And we did this. Uh, by identifying uh, the neighbors. And of course, you can uh, have some sort of a first degree neighbor, a second degree neighbor, and so on. So I will uh, inform you about uh, this in, in uh, the following a little bit more in detail. So what we have here uh, is that all these information yeah, on, the, on the number of previous attacks uh, that were included into the analysis, the media coverage, and also the hoaxes, yeah, have this, uh, also this neighboring structure. Yeah? So this refers to the, to the county itself and to the neighboring counties that were in the data set. Okay? And yeah, this is just the context events I already mentioned. So uh, this border opening, uh, was framed in the Zeit, in a German newspaper, was uh, the night Germany lost control, migrant crisis test score of uh, board, open borders. Uh, that, so this was really referred to as open borders. And uh, we had here this uh, Cologne New Year uh, gang assaults that were also uh, covered in the media quite well. So this is the setup, and now uh, the results. Uh, here is the total number of arson attacks we have in our data set um, on all the 402 counties uh, that we, we have here. And you see this is not a random distribution at all. So th there is some, um, there is some uh, indication of this spatial dependence here. And uh, you see, of course, uh, there are uh, in the, the east, yeah, uh, there is a, a high number of arson attacks in the east, but also, this is also important to see that in, in, in some parts of western Germany, you find also a quite high number of, of, these, uh, of these attacks. And uh, when it comes to compare these maps with other maps, for example, where the right-wing parties uh, uh, are very strong, you s obviously would see some correlation. So what I will do now is not looking uh, 
at the maps, but looking at first at some regression uh, results. Uh, this is not as uh, intuitive as, as maps, uh, I know. But nevertheless, we have some logit uh, regression model here. The dependent variable is uh, here the, the arson attack in a county at a given time point in our uh, window of observation. And we see here positive or negative effects that are uh, significant or not significant. And this is, uh, this is what uh, the statistical package data gives us when we estimated it with uh, some additional uh, specifications, of course. Uh, I translate this uh, table into average marginal effects that are much uh, easier to, uh, to interpret. And what we here see is, first of all, that the pr number of previous attacks yeah, have a positive influence on further attacks. So this really says there is some sort of a, a dependence yeah, uh, on what happened uh, in a county before. So in this uh, model, we do not see significant uh, effects for local media and the hoaxes. What was quite interesting for us, and I tell you in a minute uh, what we did with this result, we see a clear uh, point that the higher, the, the bigger the county is, the, large, the more people uh, living uh, there, the much more likely the county is that there is control for all other factors. I have to say that's the, the logic of such a regression model. Uh, the higher uh, the probability that there will be a uh, xenophobic attack, an arson attack. And we also see a positive correlation with the uh, share of NPD voters. And what, what we also uh, clearly see is uh, that the higher the number of foreigners is, the lower the probability. This is also a, a very strong, a significant effect. You have to, uh, you, this, these are non-standardized effects, but you see uh, these confidence intervals, uh, meaning if they overlap uh, with the null uh, line, then you can say they are statistically not significant, whatever this means. Uh, but uh, we, we see, for example, that unemployment, uh, in contrast to to foreigners does not have an effect. We see that the two events uh, have quite different effects. We have here the New Year's Eve, no overlap with the null, uh, but we have a very strong uh, average marginal effect toward the quarter uh, open. What uh, I can um, show you in a graph in a minute. So results, uh, we did several or quite a lot of robust, robustness checks. It's now usual when you do such kind of analysis that you ask yourself, uh, are these uh, results that you received running one model, are they robust against uh, specifications that you uh, can change? And we did this uh, especially with, uh, first of all, introducing some sort of a spatial error term. The, this is uh, framed in the econometric literature uh, with spatial regression models or something like that that uh, colleagues uh, sometimes do, um, meaning that uh, you have some weighting metrics for the error term. Uh, this is one thing we did. Second, uh, we also tried uh, some uh, alternative uh, combinations of defining what is a neighbor and what is the time lag, so to speak. So we had first and second order neighbors, um, meaning that also a county that is uh, only a second neighbor might have influence on the probability of an additional arson attack. And also uh, we have here uh, one or two uh, two period time lags, yeah? meaning that not only what happened the last 14 days is relevant yeah? in the statistical sense, but also what happened the, lag, uh, the last uh, um, four weeks. Yeah? So this is the, the things we, we uh, tried. And uh, yeah, what, uh, what happened, uh, most of the results uh, hold. Uh, there was uh, one exception, and we uh, are still working on this, uh, 
be preparing to uh, submit uh, these uh, kind of analysis to to uh, journals, of course, but what we're still working on is the media coverage thing. This is some sort of a volatile effect, uh, and the media coverage does have an influence in most other mo models. So in contrast to the very first one uh, I presented uh, to you, uh, and in a way, uh, it should be robust to convince people that this is really a a research finding we can uh, build on. Uh, yeah, it's still unsolved this problem. Here, uh, the promised uh, graphics on uh, the number of arson attacks over time, and you see here the two peaks and um, controlling for other factors. The first one is uh, really uh, referring, obviously, stati in the statistical analysis to this event in the beginning of September. And the second one is also, you can see the, the second peak in the beginning of uh, 2016. There's also a second peak. But controlling for the factors in the model, this was not a significant effect. But I can tell you, this was uh, the New Year's Eve. There was a different effect for East and West Germany. It was in West Germany. It was. Uh, it was statistically significant, yeah? but I do not make so much out of this statistically significant story. Uh, so, uh, in a nutshell, the, the results, arson attacks are more likely in bigger cities, uh, in counties with few foreigners, in counties with a higher share of right-wing party voters, and just after the border opening in 2015, and we see it's not a, a very strong, but we see a, a stable spatial contingent uh, effect. We see, and it, this is also uh, relevant, I think, no effect of the unemployment rate and yeah, uh, it, uh, a very selective effect of this uh, New Year's Eve in Cologne. And more analysis are needed for the local media coverage and the fake news. And because I think it's also relevant to think about some substantive conclusions that you can draw from your research, yeah, I think this is also uh, an important thing that you can uh, expect from research that is done. So what we can learn from this when it comes to this ugly side of uh, human behavior against uh, people coming uh, to, to a country it's clearly not that easy. Uh, it's not the e economy. Yeah? It's not the economy. Um, and what is, uh, I think, one thing that can be uh, yeah, considered is how the administration distributes refugees over the country. They do it by the Königstein Schlüssel. That's some sort of an administrative magic thing that means that uh, each uh, state in Germany more or less has the same proportion yeah, um, of, uh, of refugees to, uh, to care for, uh, proportion in relative to the inhabitants they have. Yeah? And uh, as we see from the maps and from our analysis as well, uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, the interaction, so to speak, yeah, of these refugees with uh, the population already living in these counties, it might be a good idea to think about how to, to do this, to arrange this in a, in a different way. Yeah? For the sake of uh, the refugees, of course, but for the sake of all of us. There is an interesting study of Dominic Hangartner of the ETH, showing that in Switzerland, uh, where refugees can also contribute earlier than in Germany to the labor market, labor market integration in some of the cantons is much easier than in others. So the distribution, the equal distribution uh, over all Switzerland is contraproductive in a lot of terms. And this also, I think, applies to the German case, although here the regulation for going into the labor market is somewhat different. So the acceptance and the integration depend on, um, on preconditions. S specifically, 
the number of uh, foreigners, the, some sort of a, are people living in these counties uh, already uh, used to some foreigners? Yeah? There are, in, in some of these counties, the small communities, if you do this on a community level, it, it even gets more interesting because in some communities where these uh, refugee homes were placed or planned for, there was no foreigner living there uh, before. So this is the first contact, so to speak. So this is also something that was very special in, in the situation in some of these East German counties. So, uh, yeah, what I think is also very important is uh, I think this uh, spread of uh, such an behavior uh, is uh, much related to the acceptance of it in the society of other people. So, uh, how norm abiding people uh, are. Uh, so, in, in this sense, it's very important to my uh, impression and to uh, I think to, based on, on other uh, research, of course, that there is strict legal prosecution uh, of these uh, xenophobic attacks. This is a very crucial thing because if, in, in, if you have them around and you do nothing against it or to, to less against it, then there is this uh, danger of a, a contagion uh, that this is something that is normal to, to act or some, some sort of normal. And of course, it would be good to avoid an extreme situation as we had in September, but this is uh, not totally <laughs> in the hands of the politicians and of us, of course. So, and I see, of course, uh, some limitations. Uh, it's clear that collective behavior was studied in this uh, presentation very indirectly. Um, but I would say, to some degree, yeah, some sort of a xenophobic attack in a, in a sense that you set a, a refugee home on fire, uh, is, there is some collective orientation that people acting together. Yeah? Of course, I cannot show this with my data, so I have some assumptions about that. The aggregate uh, units of an analysis are, in a way, too large. I, uh, unfortunately cannot uh, cover these interesting cases uh, showing is this uh, different when there was no uh, foreigner living uh, in, a, in a, a small community before. This is also very interesting. Um, but uh, in this uh, presentation, the unit uh, was the county, and this is too large. And of course, you can also uh, yeah, debate whether the kind I, or we defined this uh, media influence using the Bild Zeitung yeah, uh, and also this uh, HOAX map is, is the right way to do it. And I'm uh, absolutely happy to hear suggestions to get this uh, better done. Thank you for listening. Right. But I'm curious if you looked at not unemployment but economic anxiety, because there's some interesting work in the U.S. showing yeah. that one of the biggest predictors of whether you voted for Trump and continue to support him is not unemployment. I mean, these people could be very well off, but how anxious you felt yeah. about your future economy. Yeah. No, that's a that's a very good point. Um, here I. Uh, refer to the hard data uh, of the unemployment rate, saying this has to do something with uh, probably the anxiety, uh, the, the people having uh, the, the fear uh, from uh, unemployment. But I see uh, that this is not completely uh, the same. So what uh, is needed is on a county level, yeah, uh, that it would be needed to have some indicators for that fear, anxiety. And uh, having the surveys uh, on, on this uh, done in Germany, I'm afraid that I do not get this information uh, on this uh, fine-grained level of counties. You have it for states and for some bigger cities, of course, but it's uh, relatively complicated to get it for 402. And you see the spatial distribution uh, included some of uh, rural uh, area, 
areas where you do not have the survey data. But I think this is, a, in, in principle, a very good idea to include it. Yeah? I mean, this is not the first time, right? I mean, if we look back in 1991, when OSL and other places right. actually refugees' homes were, were burned down and attacked, yeah. I mean, this had nothing to do with, with the huge flood of refugees coming in. Nevertheless, it looks like that certain places on this map seem to be repetitive. So is there, yeah. I mean, do these people not learn from what has happened in the past? Or is it just the concentration of people that are just happen to be Well, it was in the, in the beginning of the 90s. First of all, I uh, again agree that it's a very good idea to, uh, to, to have an even broader uh, yeah, a window of uh, yeah, looking at the whole uh, xenophobic attacks uh, on, on foreigners in, in Germany. And this would give us the chance to identify are there certain uh, regions where this comes up over and over again. And I, uh, when I uh, think of the beginning of the 90s, uh, it was also about refugees at that time, asylum seekers. Of course, this was more uh, the dramatic situation of changing the total system in East Germany from communist past to this capitalist uh, uh, present. But it was, again, uh, it was about refugees, and it was about, uh, um, I think this was the first time that was this asylum uh, problem addressed also in, in the media. It, there was an inflow of uh, people coming from uh, former Yugoslavia at that time, uh, Bürgerkriegsflüchtlinge. And um, yeah, I would say uh, you see some of these uh, waves of, of these attack waves, yeah, they are related to such uh, things like incoming uh, uh, flows of, of uh, migrants. I think there is some, uh, thing that you can, uh, some evidence that you can relate uh, these two things together. But you have another question? No, I no. just wanted to point out that yeah. I mean, if you say that there was a downfall of the communist times and right. Germany was changing, I mean, that goes along with that you would actually have a really good connection to the socioeconomic status because if you look at Saxony, for instance, it's been flourishing. If, if we look on the, on the, on the map and how, how they're doing economically, um, nevertheless, it seems to reappear at Saxony. Right. And, you know, and even so, the social status should have improved over time. And if, if you look at the refugee wave, I mean, Yugoslavia was one of the few places that East Germans could have traveled. So, yes, I mean, it's not as foreign as, for instance, you have people from, from Libya or somewhere coming. So, I mean, mm -hmm. questions that you can't answer, but that just come up in my mind and, yeah. you know, are of interest. Um, in the timeline that you showed with the attacks, there was, there was a peak that preceded the event that you were talking about. And so it looks to me like increase was already happening before this announced. Yeah. This was very at the beginning here. Uh, this was uh, over the year of 2015. Yeah, there was, uh, this is uh, September of 2015, I think. And this was the year of 2015. So it already started, yeah, the, the influx started already much uh, before uh, September, yeah. But the peak was in September. Right, so I was curious about the start yeah. of that increase and then also what led to the, yeah. the decrease that happens afterwards. Yeah, uh, that's also a good point. We uh, modeled uh, it uh, with this, uh, with a decay uh, function and you can, in a, in a statistical model, yeah, you can play around what is uh, the time period uh, you define that some of these events will not have an influence at all. Yeah? And we did this, uh, I think, here also with this two weeks uh, period. And this was quite robust, uh, showing that uh, if you look for events here, yeah, uh, that this uh, has an, um, an influence in, in, in this statistical sense that I uh, referred to. So it's not dependent uh, that something happened uh, before, we saw what happened before. This was an, uh, a permanent, uh, there was even before um, 
We started this uh, time uh, of observation in the first quarter of 2015. Yeah? So you see here we started it. And uh, in the beginning of 2015, and we really observed until January of 2017. And um, it is just, it, it, in, a, in a way, it's a, it's a decision uh, that you have to make when you uh, set up such a model. What are the prominent uh, overall uh, events yeah, that were covered in the media that could influence such a, could fuel such a process yeah, that are not only relevant at the local level, but they are relevant in general. And this was the, the idea to, to cover this, uh, these two events. And we see at least for one event, controlling for all other variables, that it really uh, yeah, uh, even fueled this process, bringing it, it, it up to the peak. When talking about xenophobic attacks, um, both media, the journalists, and also politicians, and maybe also many people generally assume that there's a relation between hate speech and how we frame right. uh, the debate about refugees, uh, whether we talk about the refugee wave, for instance, they have these terms with negative connotation, and actual physical attacks. So this assumption is very often made. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any evidence, and of course, um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, so I don't know. But, yeah. but your data seems to su suggest that this is actually not the case. So this would mostly, I uh, think the variable that you have that is closest to this would be the fake news, the hoax map, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which of course did not particularly focus on, you could, can also have hate speech that is not fake news, and you can also have right. framing, uh, like the terms of the refugee wave, which are not fake news, but just the framing of the events. Do you have any yeah. Um, idea how one could further look at this relation between how people yeah. talk about things and how action is then taken. I mean, whether it fuels action or whether the action just mirrors how yeah. people think anyhow. I mean, this is uh, really a good idea to include this uh, hate speech uh, analysis uh, as well. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, it's not that easy because all the blocks where you uh, could have this information, they... they uh, react, often react uh, to such a wave of hate speech coming in by closing the block. Yeah, so you, but this could also uh, use, be used as uh, an indicator. Um, I have to say that uh, I do not have uh, the experience uh, to do such analysis, but it's, I think it's possible to include it. I think looking at certain blocks uh, could be one way to approach uh, this and uh, you have the number of uh, block entries, of course, and you can also do a qualitative analysis what, what is hate speech in these blocks. And then th this could be included into this analysis, I think, in principle. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We know from animal behavior that the perception of the risk is often more important than the real risk. Yeah. So I, I think it would be super important maybe to make another model, as you just maybe indicated. Right. So So uh, I was happy to show that the real threat <laughs> is not uh, such influential in a way. So this, I think, is also a clear uh, result. But I totally agree. Perceptions, uh, we know this from the, uh, from the other cluster, where we look at, at the perceptions of inequality and the effect on mobiliz political mobilization. It's the perception thing. Yeah? And I do not have the data in my, in my study so far to cover that. True. So, following up with this, uh, the, the events that you chose, uh, do you think it also makes sense to uh, take into account events that happen across Europe? Because Europe is so Germany, I mean, like, uh, right. for example, in 2015, is, there was the attack in Berlin. Right. And after that, it triggers the wave. Of, right. I mean, like you say, rise of right wing, it's also all across Europe, sort of, say. Mm -hmm. It's not isolated. Some trigger events might lack mm. in other countries as well. Do you think mm -hmm. that that kind of... 
No, that's, that's also a good point. It's, it, it's in a way difficult to make a decision what to integrate into a model and what, what uh, to, to leave out. Um, but I think uh, this, we, I think we did it with the Paris attacks. It was in November and there, there was no, uh, no effect. And we fo focused very much on the German media coverage uh, bringing this local information on of the Bild Zeitung you know, all over the country, together with this Hoax map, so this would make up to another point. Interestingly, there are some there are some uh, studies showing uh, that these kind of uh, events actually uh, trigger the perception of threat. Yeah, and there is this uh, paper by. Joshua Legevi showing uh, that uh, the perceptions of uh, yeah, migrants coming, I don't know migrants, but it, it was general, the attitudes to, towards foreigners, I think, is influenced uh, by events. It, he used data uh, from a survey that was in the field when the attacks of 9-11 uh, uh, happened and there was some effect. I uh, am here at the sociology department uh, responsible for the Konstanze Bürgerbefragung, the Constant Citizen Survey. And here I also tried to find, there was a question about uh, the attitudes of constant citizens towards granting asylum yeah, to the, uh, in, in this period. And it was exactly in the autumn of 2015. And, uh, yeah, I did not found any effect of these uh, terrorist attacks on the, the measured Constance attitude. So you can say Constance is, is such a nice place and people do not care about what happens in, in Paris or whatever. But it might also be that these uh, single studies, yeah, this is often the case in, in, in the social sciences, but maybe also in the natural sciences, that, that when you have provoking uh, findings, yeah, that people like to uh, exaggerate a little bit, like this Joshua Legevi finding, this is, might also be a little bit uh, yeah, exaggerated at all. But I'm not sure. Can you speak a little bit more about how you use the neighboring counties, um, to what degree that they were? How did you include that in the model? Were they controls, or was it some part of the variable? Of no, in this, in this data set, uh, it was by definition, it was, uh, I um, defined uh, the, these variables that I used on the media, on the fake news, and on the number of previous attacks, uh, also for the first degree neighbors, for the uh, counties itself, and together with the first degree neighbors. Of course, the process to define it, it's not that easy. It's, as I refer to, it's relatively complicated to do this, but there are, um, tools uh, in R, for example, where you can do these kind of spatial uh, neighbors. And you can even identify the second, uh, uh, second degree neighbors and so on. And as I told you, if you play around with these neighborhood uh, def definitions of, on the county side, you get somewhat differing results for this media uh, coverage. So you had uh, a conclusion, one of the conclusion was clamp down on all those uh, xenophobic attacks and uh, put them in jail or worse. Um, the or worse is my part, not your part. Um, and you had a mechanism for that. You know, you're saying, well, not only because they're criminals and criminals should be in jail, but it is dangerous because it's contagious. Right. If that's the case, do we have uh, enough cases where we know there was prosecution or they arrested people, and if that's an event, that would actually reduce the chance of uh, uh, an arson. Right. So I absolutely agree. This is also not uh, covered uh, in the data. Uh, so this conclusion is more or less uh, drawn on uh, other research uh, that we know uh, how yeah, 
norm abiding uh, behavior is uh, is um, in in a way stabilized in 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 a, in a society, and uh, if norms if people know yeah that norms are are uh, no longer followed by a, by a majority, the norm can very rapidly uh, broke down completely. Yeah, and there are these processes that you have. It's again the perception yeah, that uh, it's, it's the prosecution is hard and um, so I would again more argue with the perceptions people have in mind about norm abiding behaviors of others at, or, the, or in the contrary people breaking the norms. Yeah? If you have the perception that this is some sort of a normal behavior, some sort of a normal behavior, uh, then it uh, more easily spreads further on. Yeah, thank you very much.